ideas. Um, and Pamela or Alice, I think, mentioned, I think it was Pamela, uh, the Kit Kat Club. You know, it's an age of clubs. So not only did they know each other through um, the House of Lords, but they knew each other through clubs, and they talked a lot in the coffee houses um, and swapped ideas. So yes, I'm sure that's the key. And of course, we've got Painsill, Isha, and Claremont, three major, major gardens of the period. Very, very close. And of course, these Rococo, the word has been used by John Harris, particularly these Rococo, but I like to use the word eclectic gardens of the 1730s and 40s, they're all clustered around the Thames. Again, you know, they are small estates, some of them, and they, everybody knew everybody else. So we've got Pope at Twickenham, we've got Walpole at Strawberry Hill, we've got Marble Hill. It's all in that area. And there were so many more. Um, and, you know, that great um, artist, Thomas Robbins, has been the one that has made most of the paintings of them. These tremendous eclectic gardens, you know, with Chinese and summer houses, Turkish tents and so on. Paints Hill, Turkish tent, Gothic umbrellas. Um, and the planting itself, they would swap ideas on planting and swap plants and so on. So yeah, everybody knew everyone else and they were feeding off each other. Yeah, is that all right? Yeah? Another one? There's got to be a lot more. Pamela, Pamela. Pamela. Hang on, Pamela, I can't hear. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, I'm, um, I'm very impressed by the number of buildings he designed. Would he have people who would, he would just do the design and then he had people building them all? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, couldn't so, do, he couldn't do any of the practical work at He all. wasn't practical at no, all? No, 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 no. I mean, neither was Vanbra. I mean, Vanbra was just uh, basically no. a dramatist, a soldier, a playwright, um, sketch, 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 and then had Hawksmoor, the architect, who'd worked with Wren, to put into um, you know, bricks and stone uh, his designs. Same thing with Kent. Yeah. Kent would do uh, designs and then the designs would be used by people on the ground. And in terms of the actual garden design, which I suppose is as relevant, if not more so, um, at Rousham, Sue will correct me, but we don't even know if he went to Rousham, do we? We know that the steward was there trying to deal with all of the things that were needed but very often, General Dormer didn't go there because he was in London, and very often, we don't even know if Kent was actually specifying some of the plants and the trees that were put in the garden. That's right, isn't it? So, yes, he would have the idea, and other people would see it to execution, both in gardens and in plant, sorry, planting and in architecture. I think Tony wants to have a go. Could we have, let's have this gentleman here, and then we'll do, and then we'll do Tony. My name's Steve Webb. Um, Hi, do we Steve. know what um, Henry Pelham thought of what William Kent had done for him at, at Isha Place? Good question. I have no idea. I don't think there's any record, which is one of the real problems about writing about gardens, because you don't, in fact, know what they're asking for, and they don't know, you don't know whether they're happy with what they've got. It's a really good question, and I, I can't answer it because we just don't have it. I mean, basically, our garden history is based on um, visitor accounts, Walpole's description of that fantastic evening he spent there, um, and obviously cartographic evidence, you know, maps and how they change. Um, but it would seem to me that Pelham was very, very pleased with his garden because if he chose to have a portrait with his secretary in a garden building, um, I think, you know, he was pretty proud of what he'd achieved. I suppose the other thing as well is that everybody came to Isha. And what we don't seem to realise, or, you know, what a lot of people don't seem to realise, garden historians do, is that um, in terms of sort of the Gothic revival, Isha is far more important than Strawberry Hill. And the reason that Strawberry Hill's got such a big press and such a big presence now, it's two reasons. One, Walpole is a shameless self-publicist, and two, Strawberry Hill survives. Pelham, much, much more austere man and a politician, and the house is almost gone with all of those wonderful houses that people now live in. Um, and it's, so it's the accident of history, in a sense. And what we as garden historians have got to do is we've got to get back to what was really on the ground at the time. 
So the only thing I can say is that he was very proud of what he'd achieved, and everybody wanted to go to Isha. It was the great Parnassus, as, Wal as Walpole said. Thanks, Steve. Good question. Now, Tony. Tony Pratt. Um, just to go back to the planting, um, you mentioned that uh, Kent is the man who, who he, he tends to bring in not so many of the, um, of the British natives he goes more exotic. Yeah. Um, presumably that is to do with the, the loosening of the formality. Yeah. Um, how important is that element of the, of the design? Because we, we talk a lot about the buildings because we've got the writing for them. But being a gardener, the plantings, mm. how important are the plantings and the types of plants being used? They become more important as the century progresses, really. I mean, again, I think it's, it's Burlington's fault, and we will call it a fault, um, to have underwritten the publication of this book, Villas of the Ancients, by Castell, which came out in 1728. Um, and that was based on Pliny's letters, but it was based on a partial reading of Pliny's letters. If you really read Pliny's letters, they don't say half of the things that Castell makes out that they say in terms of garden design. But effectively, what you get through the Castell uh, publication and through Burlington's work at Chiswick is effectively green and white. Green and white. You have white statuary against greenery and hedges. And that's basically what the Plinian or the early Palladian garden. It's very difficult to say what it is. It's just gardens attached to Palladian villas of the 1720s and 30s. But interestingly, at Carlton House, as I said, you're getting a lot more um, colourful exotic plants coming in in terms of island beds at Carlton House, and that's 35. And then you get more um, pleasure grounds and shrubberies closer to the house with more exotics into the 40s and the 50s. And of course, the person that's done the, the brilliant work on this is Mark Laird, who did that great book, The Flowering of the English Pleasure Ground. Um, I don't know how many years ago it was now, but five or six years ago. And so what's happening is that the green and white, rather austere, very intellectual garden is being subsumed into the eclectic garden and Kent's part of that. Not that I think that Kent knew very much about plants, but of course the people at the gardens did, as the Rousham letters tell us. So William White, the steward, knew, um, knew what plants were coming in. Um, so that's what I think happens. You, you, you've basically got a, a quite a simple palette that then gets pretty rich. And then, of course, what happens? Brown. Chink. Now, Brown actually does do flower gardens, but very few. And he, he goes back for the minimalism. So it's a sort of plen pendulum change. And then, of course, you get the appalling, obsequious Humphrey Repton, who reminds me of sort of Uriah Heep, sucking up to everybody. And he brings flowers back again, but brings them back in a very garish, um, unstructured, unsophisticated way. Awful man, Repton. Oh dear, it's we're on YouTube. <laughs> Lovely man, just wonderful. Is that all right? Hmm? Hmm. Are there any more questions? I'll come to you in a minute, Jeremy. Um, Janet Harrell. Janet, um, yes. Did you say that Caroline was a, um, a plant person? Or yeah. did I? Carry on. No, I, I was just yes. saying, or did I misremember? Yes, she was interested, yes, yeah. in plants. We don't know very much about that, but we do know she was interested in plants and planting, as well as in creating these garden buildings with their iconography. What, se what seems to have happened at Richmond, though, in her period, is that it was the iconography that, that was important to her, to legitimise her House of Hanover's claim to the throne. Mm. That was basically what she was trying to do. Um, and I always pronounce it incorrectly, Jim. Is it Leibniz or Leibniz? Come on, Jim. Leibniz. I'm going to put you on the spot. That's Jim Bartos. He's doing a PhD with me for you YouTube listeners and viewers. Is it Leibniz or Leibniz? Is it I-E or E-I? Leibniz? Okay. Um, Leibniz, of course, had done a lot of work for um, the, Hanover, the House of Hanover to try and connect them to the Guelphs so that they would then have an Italian 
um, background. Uh, so he was the guy that was doing the historical work. So she had actually been taught by him in the Queen of Prussia's court, and she was more interested in, as I say, in iconography at Richmond. But she was also interested in plants. And we know that that Richmond garden had lots of flower areas within the wildernesses, under planting. Yeah? OK. Uh, Jeremy. Leibniz. Leibniz. Yeah? Yeah. Jeremy Garnett. Jeremy. Um, this is really about the patronage relationship uh, between Kent and Burlington. Yeah. Um, now, bearing in mind that we've been hearing about the uh, desire to move into sort of an you know, eclectic um, expression, um, how does that sit with the, 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 the straitjacket of Palladianism, um, which Burlington is very much connected. I mean, how, how, how easy was that relationship? Um, and, and how did that sit with Kent? It wasn't, it's a very good question, and it's something, in a sense, I should have addressed, and I can now. It's a good question. Um, before 1733, Kent was very much in Burlington's pocket. And work that he was doing for Burlington was pretty chaste. But there was always a hint of the Rococo about his predilections at that stage. And when you look at Queen Caroline's hermitage, for instance, although outside it's very Palladian in a rock-faced way, it's quite Rococo inside. Now, of course, yet again, England's way behind France because France were doing uh, Rococo interiors in about 1705. They were doing those grotesque interiors, Jean Barin, about 1710. So with Burlington, what Kent does is he sort of infiltrates in an interior design sense elements that he's seen, particularly in Rome. So you get quite a lot of quattrocento details that he brings in, particularly at Chiswick. But on the outside, you get a very austere villa. You do, however, get an austere villa that's actually based on about seven or eight different villas. I mean, the whole idea that Chiswick is based on the Villa Capra is nonsense. It's nothing like the Villa Capra at Vicenza. It's much closer to work by Palladio's pupil, Scamozzi. So Burlington, remember, Burlington doesn't really appreciate Palladian architecture because he doesn't, hasn't seen it in the flesh. And what he's done is he's collected a lot of these drawings of Roman baths. So you get a lot of interiors that look as though they come out of Roman baths with great coffering, which Kent does for him based on all of these designs and drawings. And then, of course, and we don't know anything about this. This is one of the big mysteries of doing the book. Um, Burlington has a nervous breakdown in 1733. He really definitely has a nervous breakdown. And he leaves the court. And he loses all of his sinecures and all of his control. And Kent is suddenly free as a bird. And what happens in 1733? Isha, Clermont, early work possibly at Stowe. And then he moves through the 30s without Burlington breathing down his neck and creates the eclectic urge and creates the Arcadian garden. It's still Arcadian, but it's Arcadian with a twist. And that's what I think happens. Uh, so Burlington, some malign influence, finishes. So someone needs to do a lot more work on that 1733 nervous breakdown. Good question. Uh, any more? Any more? Yes, the lady there. Um, my question just follows on in respect of Lord Burlington, and I wondered if, in fact, there was a possible political motivation. Um, is there a link between Burlington's promotion of Palladian and the Whig Party versus the promotion of the Baroque with the Tories? Ah, interesting. Uh, good question. No. <laughs> no, because, um, as you will appreciate yourself, that's quite too simple, really, isn't it? It's quite simple. That, that way of looking at things in sort of... Um, you know, it's not a simple question, but the way of looking at it sort of with the two polar opposites. Um, because when you actually look at the patronage of the period, quite a lot of Tories are...